good. I'm Are good. we good? We're That's good. good because we're live. We're live. And just right uh, YouTube. Hi, YouTube. This is Babylon 5 for the first time. The unedited, unfiltered approach. And I, it's been months, but I'm back fisticuff with uh, with Xfinity over here. So <laughs> Brett and I made the decision. We're just going to go for it. So things are they get weird. They're going to get weird. Yeah, we are recording independently, so the podcast is good. But if you guys see Jeff uh, freeze over there or something like that, we're trying. If this becomes absolutely untenable, we'll stop this and we'll try this again on another day. But uh, we're, we're going to try to get through this one. We're feeling good. Yeah, I, I think it'll be fine. This one. I think so normally we give a nice fun pre-show. We talk a little bit. This is this is the recording, right? This is what it looks like to make the podcast. And this is the show. This is YouTube. how you fight through adversity right. and technical difficulties and just try to make it happen. And just do it. But I think for today, Brent, I say we uh, we get to it. I'm with it, dude. Let's yep. do it. Let's make hey, this. Uh, like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff, YouTube. You guys know what to do. We love you. Big hearts. Comment down below. Don't spoil anything, please. And it's not like this is, a, I mean, this isn't a very important episode or anything. No, so, I all. mean, if it all falls apart, it's probably fine. Yes. Please go back if you haven't watched my Brent Watches video and like the first like two or three minutes, see my rant about spoilers for this episode. Just go see that. I won't repeat it here. Go ahead, Jeff. Let's cool. Let's go. Let's do it. It's my first time. You're new here, aren't you? First time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who can push through anything. And this anything is a very long season two of Babylon 5. But we have got to this part, Jeff. We are watching the show for the very first time. We're searching for Star Trek-like messages and trying to see how much we like this series. And while this is not a star, uh, and while this is not a Star Trek podcast, Brent and I do have Star Trek podcasts, and so those references tend to find their way into our conversations. But to keep us honest, we play the rule of three. That means each of us gets three references to Star Trek apiece, and that's it. Three. One of those three. No substitutions, exchanges, or refund. <laughs> Brent, we have. A five-star review. Oh, yes. This one is from Audible. You can listen to us on Audible. Which Shout right, out Audible. Yeah, basically means we're authors. I mean, we're published. We need, uh, what's, what's the Audible version of IMDb? We need to get on that. Yeah, exactly. Well, this one's not too long. It's from Mark. And Mark says, love your podcast. I enjoy hearing you guys theorize about what is coming up. Always enjoyable. Thanks. Mark, you are very welcome. We enjoy theorizing about what's to come up, and I promise there's going to be some theorizing in today's episode as well. Just just a smidge, probably. Yeah. Well, we have a four-star review from Good Pods. I don't know, Brent, if you uh, have used Good Pods before or not. I have, but is their scale zero to four, or do they have a five-star scale? So uh, this is from Sam on Good Pods. Uh -huh. And up, Sam? Sam actually emailed me um, about the review to let me know that Sam's one of those people who believes that no one and no one thing is truly perfect. You know what? Sam is my people. Yeah, right. I screw up people's ratings all the time. If you come to me and you say it's five stars or nothing, then I do not value that. Then I'm not going to do your, your show or I'm not going to do your survey, you know? Yeah. Like, Oh, we, we strive for this or nothing. You know, if, if, if we don't get at least five or 10 or whatever their rating is, then we've completely failed. And I'm like, then you have zero interest in actual feedback. All you want is to bait is just to feel good, which I'll be honest, getting five-star reviews makes me feel really good. But I also appreciate genuine, well thought out, constructive feedback. Totally. And what I love about Sam's review and, and in the email Sam offered too was, like I said, no one's truly perfect, but 
if I could rate you a 4.5, I would. So we're like as close to perfect as Sam will ever allow us to get. But I want to give it qualify as a five star review then. Oh, yes. I'm going to take every opportunity to hit that one. Right. But I do want to just give a quick shout out to anyone listening on Good Pods. And if you don't listen on Good Pods, it's kind of a cool little app that has this social feature. Like you follow people, just other podcast listeners, and you see what they're listening to. And it's a great way to help grow uh, our audience because people will see, oh, that. This person who I like and trust watched Babylon or listened to Babylon five for the first time. Maybe I'll give that a listen also. So, which makes a lot of sense because like, if you're listening to something and somebody else is listening, you guys obviously have a shared taste and there good chances are you have more than one shared taste. Mm -hmm. So creates it's not a really bad idea. Creates a really cool community, but Sam in their four star review of us, uh, four and a half in spirit says, I love listening to you developing the theories as I first watched when I was around 10. So I couldn't come up with them. And I now know what happens next. I'm really looking forward to you getting to season three, but two has been interesting as well. All right. Well, uh, Sam, was it? Yeah, Sam, Sam, uh, we love theorizing. I'm not sure if you just called us 10 year olds or not, but uh, regardless, it's been a lot of fun and you know, what's coming next. We don't Jeff, we don't. And this episode specifically, there is a lot of, I, I guarantee you, I'm going to call, this is like the serious black of Babylon five. Okay. I'll explain that later. Just remind me, don't let me get out of here without talking about that. Like there's your teaser. Yeah. I've got one more. This one is uh, through our website, Babylon5first.com. It's the number five in the word first.com. We have a contact page on there, and Andrew used it. Andrew sent us an email that I think is very appropriate for this particular episode. All right. He says, one of the things I've noticed is that based on your predictions from episode titles, you may be spoiled by modern serialized television, and you aren't even aware of it. A lot of modern shows are presented as extended 10 hour movies with each episode smoothly running into the next Babylon five. Isn't like that. Babylon five is a very transitional show with one foot in the old episodic way of doing things and the other in the 21st century style of serialized stories. Episodes won't lead directly from one to the next, at least not for the first couple seasons, but no spoilers. There are foreshadowed sometimes, and they won't pay off for literally many seasons. So I worry that when you make predictions that the very next episode will deal with the same stories or plot lines as the ones you're discussing, I worry you're setting yourself up for some disappointment. Yes, we are setting ourselves up for some disappointment, but I will say we have gotten to that spot though, Jeff, where we say, this is what I want it to be about, which is a continuation of the story. But we know that it's not going to be because that's the way this works. Yeah. Like we've kind of gotten to that spot. So um, I I 100% feel everything you're saying there. Um, and I thought this was good for this episode because yeah. like it just it this is the continuation of like all those episodes we've been bagging on all season. Like they finally <laughs> like now they mean something Do now. They? at the end Do of they? the season. Well, you know, there was a four minute dialogue piece that told us they did. <laughs> more more on that later. Okay. <laughs> because I like I have a suspicion. I haven't I haven't gone back and watched any of those episodes since we did them because honestly I don't want to watch most of them again. True. Um but okay, here the serious black thing. I'll just go ahead and say it now. Here's my suspicion is when we do go back and do a rewatch, maybe we'll maybe maybe uh, we got our season two recap coming up here soon, our yeah. wrap up show. Maybe I'll do a, like a binge of season two just oh. to go back because what I suspect, I don't know if this is true. Do you ever, do you ever read Harry Potter? I never yeah. read. I only watched the movie. You only watch Actually, I think it's in the movie as well. Okay. There's a character called Sirius Black. Mm -hmm. We meet Sirius Black in the third film slash book. And he continues to be a presence throughout the rest of the, of the, the series. He's actually a rather major character. Well, what you realize is after you have met him and then go back and reread the books, he was mentioned in the very first chapter of the very first book. 
Really? He And I'm pretty sure that he was mentioned in the opening scene of the first movie as well. Because it was his bike that he lent to Hagrid that Hagrid used to fly Harry to the Dursleys all those years ago. Really? Yeah. Huh. And and he comes in, he's like, young, serious, black, lent it to me. Now, sometimes the books and movies confuse themselves in my head. And somebody's typing like, oh, that was just the book, not the movie. Which actually, now that I think about it, that's probably correct. But he was there and you're like, when you go back and rewatch it, you go, oh, he was there. Oh, my gosh, he was there the whole time. Huh. And I have a feeling that there is a lot from particularly from those episodes we didn't like that is like see it was right here the whole time it was right here and here's what i would say to you folks out there if that's the case let jeff and i discover that upon the rewatch like don't steal the oh it was right here from us like just let it be because i promise you jeff at least as far as i'm concerned just about everything in this episode was brand new information really Uh uh-huh See, by your response there, I know it wasn't. Yeah. But it was almost this was all almost brand new information to me. Okay. That's interesting. Cause uh-huh. I think for me, and this is or diving way ahead, we'll get into this more, but this really conf- a lot of it just confirmed things that had been planted through like all of those t- terrible episodes. That's not fair. Through all those episodes that we didn't enjoy as much as people think that we should have. But sure. I believe you. I have no idea what you're talking about, but okay. Well, we'll get there. You know, Jeff, I like our games here at Babylon 5 for the first time. We have the rule of three. We have whatever bit it is that we do at the end of the episodes. We have other things. One of the things that we do a lot that I absolutely love, and uh, one of our emailers here just uh, d- just talked about it, predicting what the next episode is going to be about based on title alone. We do that at the end of every episode. Once we're finished with this one, we'll talk about whatever next week's episode title is going to be. Um, so we'll talk about that then and make a prediction based on that. We haven't seen anything. We don't know anything about it. We've never watched it before. Now's the time to pay the piper, though, Jeff. Now's the time to look back on last week and talk about what we thought this week was going to be about and see how close we were. Jeff, do you remember what you said in the shadow of Zahadum was going to be about? I do, more or less. If I remember right, I thought that this was really going to kick off the the war with the shadow, the Great War, specifically. I, I talked about how... Um, the opening credits have talked about this is the year the great war starts and we've only seen the Narn and Centauri war. And I thought this was going to be the shadows coming to start the big great war with Zathras and Babylon four and, and, and all that stuff. And well, while it involved the shadows, um, there wasn't, there was no war in, uh, in this one whatsoever, great or otherwise. What about you? What did you, uh, what did you guess? Well, Zathras was not in this episode. No. Zathras was predicted to be in this episode, but Zathras not in this episode. But speaking of Zathras, Jeff, you just mentioned this to me. You you, you just said something. It triggered something in my memory. I was thinking about Zathras because I completely predicted this would be a Zathras episode. Yeah. Right? Because of the Z. And I, I figured that Zahadum would be where Zathras was from oh. or whatever. Like, I, I didn't know. Um, because I promise this is the first time we've ever heard the word Zahadum before. <laughs> yeah, sure. Except for like the you know the second episode of the nope. <clears throat> season. <clears throat> no, nope, it wasn't in it. It wasn't there. <laughs> um. Okay, Zathras, help me remember or spin the yarn with me here. Okay, got to go back because we only met him in that one episode, mm-hmm. right? Was Zathras from the future? I believe so. Okay, so. Like, can I just throw something out there about Zathras? Because if Zathras is from the future and he's looking for the one, you know, and and there's there's what was Sinclair and Delin at the time, whatever that's going to wind up being. If Zathras is a time traveling alien who is in the midst of a battle in a great war, is he from a future war with the shadows when they come back another thousand years into the future? Hmm. Or however far, and he's coming back to try to prevent that war. 
Because remember what Delenn said in this one? They were defeated, not destroyed. Yeah. If they can destroy them, then Zathras doesn't have his war in the future. And his civilization can be saved, right? That makes sense. Like, like uh, I don't know. People are either losing their minds right now or they're just laughing their butts off at me. Right. It's one of the two. But just what if? I don't know why. Like you, you talked about Zathras and and all that kind of stuff, and I was I was kind of going, well, who was Zathras? Like just trying to think through it. Yeah, because so. I think he was from the future, but I think I think that just shows how the word kind the the word the show kind of plays loose with certain words, right? Like shadows. Shadows is, I mean, that's that's just your applies to everything pronoun at this sure. point. You know, hey Jeff Aiken, shadow shadows. It's that's how it mm-hmm. is now. But I think also great war is now a thing, you know, because Zathras said great war. You know, we've been fighting in the great war for mm-hmm. whatever amount of time. And then the opening credits. And this is where, God, all the way from the end of season one, people are telling us, don't watch the opening credits. And we try, like I try to hit skip, but I yeah. tend to watch it with my daughter and all, uh-huh. whatever. I saw him and it right there, the great war This is the year the great war started. Well, which which great war? Because apparently there are they happen every couple thousand years or something. I, I don't know. I mean, I it's know. it. I had a prediction the other day that what was uh oh no, where was it? There was an episode where they talked about the shadows living out in hyperspace. Yeah, that was the one with uh Keffer in the there was the uh, explorer ship, the explorer ship with the other captain guy that yeah, I don't remember. I don't buddies remember. With Sheridan. I, don't, I don't know. I have to go back and watch it again. But um, I remember saying that it's either species 8472 or it's it. Yep. Does that I'm count? Not, I'm not going to count it because you're that was from a, pre- there's a previous reference. Yeah, you're referencing that was a reference prior. to a reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it. Remember, like, uh, you know, come come to the dark place. Everything floats here. Yeah, that right there. Uh-huh. Like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's what it is. And they, you know, they come back every, every so often. I yeah. Know. Well, we've been kind of diving into this Brent. So I think it's only fair for the people that are watching along with us or haven't watched these episodes in a long time. Maybe now Brent, it's time for you to walk us through what in the shadow of Zaha doom is all about. Well, the Narn Centauri war rages on. Delenn and Sheridan are making good on their promise to care for the Narn civilians. They're coming into Babylon 5 at an incredible rate, most of them injured, many of them sick, some of them alone. War is real, folks, and it's not just hurting those who are combatants. That's pretty much all we're going to hear of that for the rest of this episode. So here we go. Down in Zokolo, Mr. Morden has requested to speak with Londo, but Londo is off the station. So Veer takes this opportunity to go tell Morden what it is that he really wants, which is to see Morden's head on a pike outside the Red Keep. And Veer is going to look up at it and wave and give us the origin of one of our favorite Babylon 5 gifts ever. So not what I thought was actually going to be happening when I saw that gif. But that's really it for Morden. You see, because in Captain Sheridan's office, he's been going through some of his late wife's stuff, including the ship logs and crew manifest. And who is on that manifest who's completely supposed to be dead and totally not as dead as he should be? That's right. It's Morden. As you can imagine, Sheridan wants to see Morden right now. Station security sets up a checkpoint and nets Morden just as he tries to push his way past Kaniki. Sheridan's throwing the book at Morden over in the, the holding cell, trying to get answers about what happened to his wife. All Morden can say is, I don't remember. While Sheridan's doing that, let's check in on a couple B-plots that they got going on. Ivanova and Franklin are off discussing their lack of belief in, in religion. And yep, that's about as boring as it sounds. Talia Winters, though, she's got a little bit more of an interesting B-plot. She's met with a guy named Pierce Maccabee, which could be a very interesting name to follow up on, depending on how this particular plot plays out over the next bunch of episodes. Pierce is the leader of a new Earth Dome-backed peacekeeping group 
called the Night Watch. They exist, and they're the first and last line of defense between the realm of men and the seven kingdoms against the wildlings and the white walkers who are forced to live north of the great ice wall. As night's watchmen, they take no wife, hold no lands, father no children, and, oh, wait, actually, we're not really sure what it is the night's watch does here in Babylon 5 besides walk around with black armbands and hang out because who doesn't love to accessorize? Okay, back to Morden because that's done. Garibaldi has resigned in protest over Sheridan's treatment of Morden, especially since Sheridan hasn't even charged Morden with a crime. Sheridan gets stopped by caution to Lynn, who insists that Morden be set free or it could ruin everything. At first, Lynn is like, you're just going to have to trust us. And Sheridan's like, uh, no. And Delenn's like, okay, well, we'll tell you everything then. And Sheridan's like, huh, that was easy. You see, long ago, millions of years ago, before the Mimbari, the Narns, Earthers, and all the rest even existed, there existed another set of races that occupied the universe. We're going to call them the ancient ones or the first ones. We'll say ancient ones. Well, they all teamed up and fought against an even older race that eventually became known as the shadows. The shadows gathered on their home planet Zaha doom out on the rim. The ancient ones in the shadows fought the ancient ones defeated the shadows, but they did not destroy them. After that, most of the ancient races decided it was time to move on from our universe or ascend or whatever it is that they did. But a few of those races did stay behind in order to guard against the return of the shadows. Over the years, new races eventually evolved and came to be. And about a thousand years ago, the shadows returned, gathering once again at Zaha Doom. The remaining ancient races banded together once again, complete because it was time for the old ducks and the new ducks to unite under a new banner. Well, they also won, defeated, not destroyed the shadows and the rest of the ancient races that were remained behind. They decided it was time for them to move along as well, except for one race. Kosh's race, the Vorlons. And Kosh wears his encounter suit to hide his appearance because if anyone were to see him, they would recognize him. Yes, anyone, whatever that means. And the Vorlons are now here to help because the shadows are gathering once again at Zaha Doom. As for Sheridan's wife, she was on board the Icarus. If you'll remember this story from bunches of episodes ago, the Icarus was headed out to an archaeological dig where they discovered newly found ruins of an ancient civilization on this weird planet out on the rim called Zaha Doom. And turns out those guys were actually the ones who woke up the shadows. Dun, dun, dun. Well, they never actually tell us what happened to Morden, like the guy who was on the ship with his with Sheridan's wife, or why he's seemingly awake and alive and walking around today. But it does lead to Sheridan actually releasing Morden so that they can keep the secret that we know his secret because they're not ready for this war yet. Sheridan later goes to see Kosh and says, I don't want to learn any more about you. I want you to teach me how to defeat the shadows. And Kosh agrees to be his Mr. Miyagi. Jeff, what did you think of In the Shadows of Zaha Doom? I love this episode. Like, this is the episode we should have had. <laughs> you know, I mean, this was, well, it should have been episode that. three. Right? I mean, so I was right. I got my little cork board. I got all the stuff. It you was it, revelations. And I said, hey, you know what? You know what would be wild? What if it was Zaha Doom that the Icarus went to? And Anna they did was not killed. name this planet in Revelations. They did. It was the second episode. They called it Zaha Doom. Jakar has dropped that name at least three or four times. They have not. Are you serious? Dead serious. Like, are you serious? Like I know how to say Zaha Doom. We have said Zaha Doom on this on this show. How We've else would you it. say it? Z Z Z I'd say Zaha. 
Jadum. Jadum. I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, okay. But yeah, I was like, this is going to make it personal for Sheridan. Like, not only is there wild stuff going on on the rim, but they, mm-hmm. killed, they killed my wife. Here we are. It happened. See, all I remember about that is Jakar had his book. I remember seeing a picture of the alien creature, like drawn out in the book, like, like he's looking at book from Hocus Pocus, like, you know, we're flipping yep. through. <laughs> um, and, and I remember him saying something about there was an ancient race and there was an ancient war, but I didn't know that it was this. And it I mean, was- I, th- I think the implication was it was this, but I didn't hear the word shadows or Zaha doom or anything like that. They used all the words, like literally. So this oh is, but this God, is. Are you so kidding me? It, it was these. I'm gonna teeny, have to do this rewatch now. You are, and oh yeah, we'll talk about a rewatch because I have some. Yeah. We have some closing thoughts on this episode, right? But okay. they did these teeny tiny little little sliver chunks over like four or five episodes that we've been bagging on uh-huh. this whole season. But now, like, they mean something. I. Uh. One of the like one of the things that hit me too was last week we read Norman Lau's review at the beginning of the episode, yeah. and he's like, "Hey, for all the first ones, like, oh, now we know what that means." Are you like, kidding me, thing. Norman? First of all, well done. Yeah, because <laughs> it's good timing. <laughs> but this 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 episode for me confirmed so many things that you missed in this, uh, in this season <laughs> that, uh-huh. that they've been talking about, but it literally added like a billion years of history to the lore that's yeah. going on. And that I'm still a little confused about just everything that went down to lead to this. But I think this is, yeah, I had to, I, for, for the recap, I had mm-hmm. to watch that scene where Delenn was talking about it. Like a few times, I really wish that there was like, a little novel puppet show going on like a shadow box show to just show me what happened. Like they just call it, they just call it a box. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, but I think I'm starting to keep, (laughs) thank you. I'm starting to key in that this is like Babylon five storytelling style. Cause that's what Mm -hmm. we got in season one battle of the line was the big story and the missing 24 hours. And we just got these little teases and these little Mm -hmm. chunks and these pieces. And then at the first episode of season two, we got like four minutes of exposition with linear telling us everything that happened. And now in season two, we've got this whole season go by with little things or whatever. And we got four minutes of exposition with the Len telling us everything that happened. Except this one had some graphics that somehow Kosh was able to apparently film the Icarus stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Where did that come from? Right. Well, you know, I don't know. Hey. But uh, to me, like my last thought initially was, man, I'm loving the escalation in earth politics that's going on. Like it's getting filthy. We got the mm-hmm. office of morale last week they talked about. And now, I mean, ripped from the pages of 1984, the ministry of peace, which in the novel, the new speak, they called it mini packs. And that's what they call it here too. Like he's, I mean, he's not even trying. He's literally just like, this is Oceania. This is or as Orwellian as it's possibly going to get. Yeah. I'm with you. I love this episode. This, this is an episode you don't miss on rewatch. Yeah. No. Like you just, you just don't miss it. I'm glad they put this in because apparently I've missed it all. You know, last week was that was that episode, um, and now for a word, mm-hmm. where they basically went back and they told us what the first thirty six episodes were, like what happened in them, like the the big pieces, right? The first uh, thirty six hours right. on Babylon Five. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm I'm going to stand by. That's exactly what dude was meaning when he did that. Um, and and I said last week that that episode felt like a Okay, let's just recap everything we know so far because we're turning the corner, right? And this episode feels like we've turned the corner. And you tell me that it's kind of putting all this other stuff into perspective. Maybe it's the, okay, now let's pull the pieces together about what what's the other war going on. You know? Yeah. Uh, so as, as we continue, so I, I love this episode. I didn't feel in any way, shape, or form, like we were spinning our wheels. 
we got answers, definitive, not little bits and pieces that you got to put together and figure it out. It's a, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and here's what this is and here's what this is and here's what's going on. You know, like they laid it out for us, which is what I need. I need you to do that for me at some point, just so that I know that I got the breadcrumbs right. Right. Yeah. Or did I miss all the breadcrumbs? Let me go back and find the breadcrumbs I missed. You know, I don't know about you, Jeff. I'm one of these people. Like if I, if I'm playing a game, I'm playing like angry birds, right? You get to the end of angry birds and you know, it's got like three stars or four stars. How many you get for doing the level? If I only get like one star, I may have finished the level. Going I'm back. going back and playing because I want all three stars. Totally. Totally. I, go, I, I play Zelda. I'm trying to collect everything takes me forever right uh that's the way i am with tv like i want to go back and see all those breadcrumbs so uh yeah i i did i quite enjoyed this episode um i love when we get to find out where our frequently used gifts come from <laughs> yep <laughs> that we don't know like because you and i we we see pictures and we don't know what what's what you know uh like i mean i think of like delin with hair right I, I, I absolutely saw pictures of Delenn with hair way before we ever got Delenn with hair in the show. Did I know that that was Delenn with hair? I thought maybe, but I wasn't sure it could have been somebody else. It could have been a different thing. I didn't know. I wasn't sure exactly what I was looking at. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There, there are characters and actors that are in Babylon five stuff right now that I'm like, we haven't even met this person yet. I have no idea who it is. Yeah. You know, and we'll find out when we get there and that's okay. Like, I don't mind that. But uh, this thing with 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 Veer doing this, uh, that is way more evil and sinister than you would ever think from Veer. Like Veer has some venom. Yeah. He is spitting out at Morton and it's well deserved. Veer was next level in this episode. Good. Mm -hmm. like, so good. Veer's growing up. You know yeah. what I mean? Like this is mm -hmm. this is his coming out party where he's just like, you know, this yeah. is the debutante ball and he is dancing with everybody. Even mm -hmm. Sheridan, like he was great. Right. Oh yeah. Well, when he went in and talked to Sheridan, he's like, We're gonna have to release him. He's part of our deal. You know, I want to kill him, but we gotta let brutally. Him. I want to brutally kill him. Like not just mm -hmm. a little bit, but I want to watch it happen. I want to live that long. Oh yep. that was so much venom. Yeah. Well, I, I think let's start with the lighter stuff, right? And we can talk about mm. the Hitler Youth. I mean, uh, Night Watch. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> that was. Well, let's start with the fun thing you alluded to it in your recap, but just the Pierce Maccabee. Yeah, what a name! I, I've got to wonder if that name's not on purpose. You don't pull out Maccabees. Like those two books, there's two books in the Bible, right? The, the, yeah. the Maccabees and they're like, one is super like deep theological stuff. The other one's just the yeah. story of the persecution of the Jews. And it is, it is rough, yeah. rough stuff. And you don't, that's not just a name you pull out of a hat. Yeah. Now, I mean, Maccabees was the hero of the Jews, but mm -hmm. still yeah. like, but do I, you pierce the hero? Yeah, it's it's a thing, an action man. word. Yeah, it, it's totally a thing. So I, I don't know. And Earth Dome's gonna pay him fifty credits, fifty bucks extra a week to which, wear a I match. Mean, fifty bucks is fifty bucks, man. Hey, yeah. you want you want to put that thing on my chest? I'll sell. Hey, I'll sell advertising space on all my clothing. <laughs> we, I may just want to vet you first. <laughs> Maybe a little, but Zach was, Kanicki wasn't worried about it. You know, I'm curious if Talia, what Talia thought of the whole thing. You know, Jeff, speaking of Kanicki, this is the first time I noticed him. Yeah. I know he's been around for a handful of episodes. You keep referencing him as, as Kanicki. I never remember that he's like a thing in this show until you say it. But in this episode, there was, there was one moment, but it was that moment at the end where he's got the thing on his arm and Garibaldi's like, what's that? And he's like, hey, if they want to give me 50 extra credits a week, who am I to say no, right? Like, I was like oh, that's totally Kanicki. Yeah, <laughs> totally him and the T-Birds. Like, he played right. Danny Zuko in the Broadway version initially. Right. And, like, that just that that line was total Zuko. Like, yeah. So yeah. good. Yeah. But, yeah, like, this is the thing. And where I, I don't have high hopes for Zach at this point. So mm. is this a cult? Have they, uh, is this, is this actually a cult that they formed or is this something different? 
Not so, I, I think it's a version of like the Hitler Youth, literally, because yeah. Pierce said a thing, and I and I wrote it down, and even like italicized parts of it. We are less interested in actions than we are in attitudes. Mm. Like it doesn't matter what you do; it matters what you think. Mm-hmm. And so, what this is going to force is for you to tell on your neighbor, you know, right. and all of those things that happened in late thirties and the forties in, in Germany during World mm-hmm. War II under the Nazis. That's, that is what, and, and I mean, an armband really like they're not, there's not even an inch of subtlety in what they're doing. Yes. This right. is a cult. Yes. They're going to get pulled into stuff. And I think we also saw a, a chip in Zach's integrity where Garibaldi quit. He resigned his position over how Sheridan was dealing with Morden. Mm-hmm. He pulls Zach in and Zach's like, yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. I got you, sir. You take that mindset coupled mm-hmm. with a nice little armband and 50 bucks a week. I, I don't think I'm going to be a fan of Kanicki's here in a while. You know, but here's the thing. I would, I would look at Kanicki not in a bad way. Just as somebody who's been duped. Oh yeah. He, you know what I mean? Like he's every like, man, like every man out there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause look, you know what? He's not st- chief of security. He's not responsible for what happens. Nobody's going to hold him accountable. Garibaldi was Garibaldi had a different level of responsibility. He had a different level of cognition. Kanicki didn't. So if Sheridan wants him to go do it, Hey man, listen, he's just following orders. He's a gropo. Yeah. But we talked about that with Veer, even just following orders. I mean, you stand up in Nuremberg and that's still a conviction. Like that doesn't, you're not, it doesn't help. And I would like to think mm-hmm. maybe this is okay. And, and I'll burn one here because if, if he was a Gropo, a security yeah. guy serving on board the USS enterprise 1701 D mm-hmm. and Picard or Riker told him to do this thing, he'd say no, he'd threaten to resign his commission because in Starfleet just following orders isn't good enough. Like, well, I mean, they literally here. You, I'll burn one too. Just on top of that, they literally had a whole episode about that. Couple whole episodes about mm-hmm. that with Riker and whether or not he was going to follow the orders of his commanding officer. It was an episode called Pegasus. Great, which was the impetus for the Enterprise series, ban- uh, uh, Berman era series finale of uh, of Enterprise. Shoot, what was the name of that episode? These are the voyages. These are the voyages. These are the voyages. Right? Hit that yeah. real quick. And for the record, that's wow. actually not an Enterprise episode. That's Pegasus Part Two. It's just <laughs> Pegasus told through a different point of view. It's a it's a next generation episode with mm-hmm. Enterprise actors in it. Yeah, when we uh, when we did that one for Beam Me Up, uh, I I told Matt I said, okay the 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 episodes that were right before it, the, I was like, get ready for the Enterprise series finale, and he's like, but there's another episode after this. I was like, I know, we'll talk about that le- next yeah. week. And then when we got to that one, I was like, this is the, I called it, it's the Berman era finale. Okay. okay. And in my mind, if you separate Berman era finale from series finale of Enterprise, it actually works much better and it's much okay. more palatable. I like so, that. Yeah. But you're right. It's Pegasus part two. Like it's, yeah. they, they tried to do something. It just didn't work. And you know, whatever. Do you know this is not a Star Trek podcast, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, we took a couple minutes on that, but yeah, let's get back to it. But no, important. but I, I think you're right. That is, if okay, let's. Mm, I don't want to go there. If Kaniki knows what's going on, if he understands why Morden should be released, not not just like, hey, listen, I guess I'm going to just go do this. It's what he told me to do. You know, but once he becomes fully cognizant of what's happening, if he continues to do it, sure. But outside of that, like I, he's going to eventually have to be there. He's going to have to choose sides, Mm -hmm. but he's not setting himself up. Right. You have to be careful of who you put in your circle. And if he's going to be in these people's circle, then they're going to influence him. Yeah. More than he is going to influence them. Oh yeah. Big deal. I don't know if you had any Can we thoughts. talk about no, can we talk about Garibaldi though leading up to Mr. Leadership guy over there? Yeah. Talk about Garibaldi leading up to Sheridan, standing up to Sheridan and taking the step to actually resign his post. Garibaldi was incredible. 
He was so good. And it wasn't, I mean, the fact that he resigned was 100% the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Except for, I don't know if you remember this, but remember Talia's ex-husband, Matthew Stoner? Yeah. And Garibaldi pulling him in for no reason and reading him the riot act and taking him down the third yep. degree for, yeah. Yeah. So no, do you remember, um, when Garibaldi woke up from getting his injuries and he went in and questioned the guy who shot him unsupervised by himself, completely inappropriate. Yeah. So same level appropriate for Sheridan on this. Exactly. One. So I have all these yeah. great things to say about Garibaldi that are fully invalidated by those but also <laughs> but also like maybe those led to him part of his learning process you maybe, know his maturation yeah. as a leader because he did he gave Sheridan multiple opportunities mm -hmm. to back away he let him hey do it like this let me be the jerk let me come in and do this thing whatever mm -hmm. you do this has to stop and it has to stop now right. and and it hurt him to even like hey okay then here's the deal let him go or I'm gone. Mm -hmm. It was, and then he did, he followed through. He immediately, yeah. and you could hear the com badge get ripped off his skin. Oh God. Well, I'm, I just assume that that is the Velcro detaching itself from the hair on the back of his hand. Yeah. yeah. Cause that man's got some woolly hands. <laughs> he does. But yeah, Garibaldi was fantastic. And what I love too, it wasn't like in, um, uh, with the Drazi where, um, purple, green but where he was set aside but he still found a way to like help ivanova out with everything he hadn't decided he was going to come back right right to the force but he found a way to help him nope he's like i resign and i'm out i'm just going to go down and eat some chinese food at the zocalo like, <laughs> hey man when sheridan came and got him he didn't stop eating for weeks <laughs> he's like dude i'm in the middle of my sushi or whatever he had he's like yeah it's cool. chicken fried rice yeah no, Garibaldi was Garibaldi was a super high point in in the whole thing. I felt like Sheridan's reaction, like everything Sheridan was out of character for him. Well, yeah, but this one had to do with his wife. I mean, yeah. when we the last time we talked about Sheridan and his wife, it was so over the top with Sheridan. Yeah. And then we thought he got over it because he got the like, hey, she would have gone anyway, so you didn't really kill her. You know, uh it just makes me think back to Sinclair. And how mm -hmm. Sinclair would have, I believe Sinclair would have found a way to hold, to do it within the regulations. Like he would sure. have lawyered his way through it. Sheridan's just a sledgehammer. And I've never thought of him as a sledgehammer. That is the difference between the two of them, I suppose. Yeah. But the one thing they have in common is they get five, uh, five o'clock shadow pretty quickly. Yes. Like yes. 10 hours in and he was already looking pretty, pretty unsatisfactory. There you go. There you go, man. I get 10 hours in and I still look. Like a baby's bottom. Ten, I, I don't, ten days, ten weeks, like, you're still. Yeah, it's about the ten months. Honestly, <laughs> it just doesn't go. Um, all right, I'm gonna switch topics on you. Cool. The whole thing. Uh, I don't know if you have anything you want to talk about. The conversation between Sher uh, uh, Ivanova and Franklin, and the whole God basist foundational thing. That was completely inane to me. The one thing I did note out of that. Ivanova comes in and she says this to Franklin. I just downloaded your medical log and you've not been sleeping or you've not been whatever, taking care of yourself. And I'm like, how does Ivanova just go download somebody's medical log? Like you remember when Franklin went and downloaded somebody's bank account information? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, is this stuff just freely given in the future in Babylon five? Like does privacy mean nothing to these? This folks? is an alternate future where HIPAA was never, never passed. Right. I like guess. Right. But may, I didn't think about it so much as medical files as so much as just like uh medical doctor's log, you know, from 3 PM to the, just his work logs of uh -oh, some kind. Okay. Okay. That's did a little you, better. That's a little better, but still, did you know how long he had been awake? 36 hours, 36 hours. Was it really? I was 36 I, I just hours, that. Okay. but my, my whole takeaway on that, like the whole God back and forth thing. Hey, interesting new religions cropping up when there's aliens. Yep. Totally get that. That checks out. That would change a lot of people's views on what the almighty would look like, mm -hmm. which by the way, there is an incredible book written by, I think, I think it's a Methodist minister, but it's uh, from the mid seventies. It's called the Bible and flying saucers. 
Okay. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a pretty long essay, but okay. the, the thesis of it is everything we, almost everything we read in the Bible is the result of missionaries from other planets coming and like giving us Judaism and then Christianity. I should go read this because yeah. I love when people, I, it's one of the things I love about sci-fi. When you take known earth history and rewrite it in terms of particularly aliens doing stuff. Oh, I, 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 yeah. I eat that stuff up, man. Well, I, I think I, with I, your education, it, you would love it. Cause a yeah. lot of it, like you read it and you're just like, yeah, um, that, that, that tracks <laughs> that kind of tracks. So, yeah. but, but a fascinating thing. So it's like, that was kind of cool, whatever. But my biggest takeaway was just Franklin again, you know, I, I have to stay up for 36 hours. Ivana was like, we well, have a fully trained medical staff. Well, I appreciate your vote of confidence. He, he's take, no one else can fix this but me. I'm Dr. Franklin. I'm the greatest ever and no one else can. I, just another, another check in the box of where I'm just like, I, he's terrible. I don't like Franklin. Yeah. 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 And he get, you know, remember when he did the interview and he's like, my buddy spaced himself. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You know what that's like? Let me describe it for you. Literally, um, that's like coming up and saying, "Hey, I'm uh, I'm Jeff Aiken from the the Food Network, and I'm here to talk to you about this really great diner that just opened up." I had a buddy that went to a diner once, spaced himself. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what are you even talking about, dude? Like, yeah, that's all okay. I had on those two. Yeah, that, that's really it. Okay, so the only thing that I really have left is is the information we got from Delenn and Kosh. But it gave me a theory about Morden, okay, and what's going on. And I think we we have to have a. They de they don't tell us in this episode what actually is going on with Morden. So I think they did but, actually. Well, that's what I'm saying. So my question is: is do you want to talk about the history of the wars and everything, and then finish off on Morden, or do you want to talk about Morden and then backtrack? Let's let's, let's get to Morden last because I okay. I have an I have another theory that ties to it because I have I have. Uh, I'm not going to call this one explosive, but I, I've got to think about Morton. Go ahead. Okay. So I was pretty blown away. Is that the right word? Um, shocked. I was shocked at this story, not in a good, not in a bad way, but just like, well, now that I'm talking about it, maybe I shouldn't be so shocked, but it's like, here's this history that goes back billions of years that involved multiple races. We know that this involved the Narns at some point because of the book of Jaquan. So it must have had the Centauri plugged in, it had the Minbari. Mm -hmm. And here's Earth. What? Once again, Earth having no clue of anything what, whatsoever and just being shocked. Bruce Boxleitner was great. His face in that whole scene is just mm -hmm. literally, what? <laughs> I thought Bruce, Bruce Boxleitner, this was a stellar performance beginning to end. Oh, yeah. What they like, regardless of what you think about what Sheridan did, the way he acted and performed in this episode, fantastic. Yep. That and the editing, like when he was grilling Morden and the way it cut back, like you felt what he was feeling. It was good. But so there's these first ones, and apparently the Vorlon are the first ones. Mm. Yeah. Did it, is that what you took out of this? No. Okay, what did uh, you no, 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 yes, 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 yes. The Vorlon are uh, first ones or ancient race. They're not the first ones. They're a part of the first ones. Yeah, so my my mm, interpretation was that the first ones, in a billion years, they're going to call the Centauri, the Minbari, the the humans, the Narns, they're going to be the first ones or the ancient ones, right? So it's yep. it was like it's more of an era than a race. Mm -hmm. And the shadows predate them. Them, yeah. Yeah, so like shadows yeah. are ancient, ancient history. Mm -hmm. And then there's some ancient ones, and then there's some first ones that are tied to the ancient ones who have either taken off out beyond the rim, mm -hmm. gone to sleep, or are Vorlons. Mm -hmm. And there were well, and there were others. Like so mm -hmm. there there's all these different ones. Most of them decided to move on, whatever, whatever that is. I interpret that as ascending. They okay. just, you know, there's like, oh, they went beyond the room. They went like all of that just seems oh metaphorical God. for me for they ascended to a higher plane being because that's where we go in sci-fi, right? You just rung a bell for me. Jason Ironheart. Yes. He ascended. Yes. That when, thing. when Delenn, was it in, um, 
Babylon squared in the first season when she went in front of the gray council, right? And they said, Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to make you the new leader and Mm -hmm. all that stuff. And there were questions about, she wanted to stay on Babylon five because she believes in humanity. And she talked about that humanity represents the best of all of us there. You know, like we have to do everything we can to, to, to build up humanity. Take that with kind of the, the Minbari souls coming in. Mm Mm-hmm. I think that Delenn, the prophecy that we've never really heard is that like humanity are the next to ascend, to become, come to the level of the first ones in power well, the, and scope. The, according to Lanier, the prophecy is that the two sides of the Bimbari will have to unite. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very clear that that's supposed to be the humans and the Mimbari are going to have to unite. But uh, yeah, I mean, what if that's more than just that? What if that's also the Narn and the Centauri and everybody's going to have to unite? Everybody, maybe. You know? Um, But I'm with you on all of that. I I think that's all where that's going. Does that mean that they're going to be the next to ascend? Maybe. I don't know. I I don't know that this story is tracking that far down the future. Maybe to Zathras, all of these people are the ancient ones. And he's exactly. that time traveler thing that I was talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but he, he, what what stood out to me, though, was this first fight happened millions and millions of years ago. The next fight happened a thousand years ago. Well, the last major one was 10,000 years ago. And then there was an uprising a thousand years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I'm like, dude, you waited millions and millions and millions of years minus a thousand to come back and now you're back just a thousand years later, like a thousand years is a thousand years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not that long, but it's a long time. The difference of how long you stayed away though, (laughs) that's pretty sparse, but if they're coming back every thousand, 10,000 years, something like that, then fine. You know, gotta gotta defeat them. And that's a great time for me. I'm going to get on my mass effect run because, and I need someone out there. I need someone to tell me like, is mass effect directly influenced by Babylon? Cause there's so many of these things we've pulled out, but that's what happens with the Reapers. I talked, talked about the Reapers a couple episodes ago where, you know, they come through and they wipe out all organic life and they meld the tech, you know, bio and, and, and tech stuff together, synthetic and organic life. They do it on a scale of every 50,000 years. They come and do this. And so like, there's this rhythm being set up with the shadows coming in, but we saw a shadow. We saw him a couple times, but we saw one really great picture of them on Zaha doom when, you know, Kosh had his insider camera crew on the planet, apparently, mm-hmm. but the, it turns around and it looked that 100% was harbinger infecting the collector body, the main, the main harbinger in mass effect Two. Looked exactly the same. The eyes, the way the head moved, everything was exact. This means nothing to you at all, Brent, but Mm -hmm. I was just, my whole thing, I'm just like, oh my God, it is literally Mass Effect. Blew my mind. So I just Googled, is Mass Effect based on Babylon 5? And it is the third search engine hit. Okay, yeah. Like like the predictive text, (laughs) it's the third one that pops up. So (laughs) That makes me feel good. Yeah. Did you pick up on, um, Delenn was talking about that when they came back for a thousand years ago, Mm -hmm. so they returned a thousand years ago and stretched forth their hand and then talked about how they kind of got swatted away or whatever. No, I didn't pick up on anything with that. So I had one thought initially, and if you're on YouTube, you can see this, but in when Londo had his vision, Back in the coming of shadows, there was that thing where like his hand was coming out of the moon or whatever. Oh yeah. So is Londo the hand? (gasps) Oh, but Brent, it gets more in all alone in the night in Sheridan's vision. Garibaldi said, you are the hand. Mm, I don't know what that means at this point, but Londo or or Sheridan definitely says he is the hand. I don't know. I talked about Babylon five being pretty loosey goosey with words, but I also think they're pretty intentional about their words. 
I think there's definitely a through line there. I am going to be one of those things we have to watch on the rewatch, man. I'm adding the yarn to the cork board on the, the hand at this point. Okay. Let me, let me add some more yarn for you then. Let me tell you the yarn connection I want to make, and then I'll tell you why. Okay. This is more of a question. This would be like a, make this like a yellow colored yarn. Cause I don't know. It's just a question. I kind of doubt it, but are the shadows and Psycor in cahoots? I think we have postulated on that a little yep. bit in the past, but it's starting to, there, there's a lot of parallels that are starting to pull them together. So here's the, here's the reasoning for that in this particular time. I can't, I don't, I remember saying this once or twice before, or at least having the thought, but Morden, can we agree that Morden's a space zombie? Morden, Morden died and they resurrected his body. And like what we see now is Morden is not Morden. It is something else altogether. But I will say that his hair is inhuman. It is perfect. It is amazing. <laughs> it is so yes. good. It is no, absolutely amazing. So I, I got a totally different impression okay. in this. And that was that Icarus didn't explode. Okay. And everyone died on it. That's the story that went back to, to Earth Alliance. It landed, they did their stuff, and the shadows captured them, and they were given mm -hmm. a choice. Mm -hmm. You work for us, or you die. And Sheridan was mm -hmm. guessing, well, maybe they kept some prisoners, and they didn't respond to that. But I think Morden agreed to work with them. And, so, and that's part of why he has shadows with him all mm -hmm. the time, because they don't fully trust him to just go off on his own. It's not like he's programmed or there's a link, like they're with him and they're telling him stuff, but I think he agrees. Maybe. He's a turn. You think coach. that's it? I don't know. I, I think he's a space zombie. I, I could be wrong. You might be absolutely right. I, there is about as much evidence for one as there is the other. Agreed. So, um, but I'm only connecting that back. Do you remember there was an episode season one, maybe season two, I don't remember. They're all starting to run together. There was, uh, he, he was a space zombie, but it mm -hmm. was, you remember, it was the episode where we saw San Diego. They had yep. the, uh, Bureau 13. The, yeah. That yep. thing and right there. It was the Mars guy, the Mars guy that died and they resurrected. Yeah. That. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here thinking, and that was clearly Psychor. Yeah. Psychor has the ability to resurrect the dead. Project and bring them Lazarus. back and put them in in service to themselves. If they're working with the shadows, uh, clearly the shadows are far more ancient than they are. Did they catch that from the shadows? Are the psychor if the if the ancient ones have all ascended, maybe the shadows are the ones who get stuck and didn't get to ascend. But no, they're a more ancient race than the ancient ones. So whatever that is, there just feels like there is a connection to me that they're both having space zombies. Hmm. It would make sense. Morden has, well, no, because Mars guy had a lot of agency. Like he was. Yeah. Himself. And then he was glitching all over the place. So Psychor hasn't perfected it yet. Yeah. Cause it's them doing it instead of the shadows who've yeah. probably been doing this, you know, for, for millennia. Yeah. Right. That could make a lot of sense. I don't know. I, but that I think one, like that, I said, though, that one's yellow. That's very yellow thread. That's a, I'm not really sure, but I'm just making connections here it drives a bigger question for me though in that like what's the shadow's motivation what are they because i don't see jms writing a, a story with they're just evil and want to kill everyone like there's no clear good and evil happening here so like mm -hmm. what's what's their deal like why do they yeah. rise up why are they doing why would they are they wanting to take over the the universe is that yeah. their point like why if they haven't done it in millions and billions of years boy that's that boy, if you don't first succeed, try, try, try again, <laughs> gives that yeah. some all new meaning. So, but my last, I, uh, my yeah. big red yarn that I have then is because it was really like when they were talking about the Icarus, the whole Delenn exposition thing, there was just a lot of, I don't know, inconsistent, not inconsistent. It didn't flow well. Like it wasn't, mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. We talked about it. I had questions. You had to go back and kind of watch it a bunch to put the recap together. But 
like I said, it sounded like they captured the people in the Icarus, gave them a choice. No one ever said that Anna died. That is true. She could still be alive. And if she is still That's alive, true. she's a Morden. She's working for the shadows. So here's the episode I want to see. And that's going to be like episode 21 or 22 of season two, most likely, mm -hmm. is where Anna shows up on Babylon 5 Ooh. and walks up to Sheridan and asks, what do you want? Because she's working for the shadows. And Sheridan's answer is you. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. That is definitely an interesting thought. Um, I really, man, now you got me hoping she's dead and that just feels mm -hmm. gross. Yeah. Icky. All right. So what do, what do we make of Sheridan going to Kosh at the end and be like, I don't want to learn any more about you. I just want you to teach me to fight because I'm going to go kill those dirty, rotten scoundrels. And he's like, if you go, you're going to die. He's like, I don't like die. Teach me how to fight them. And Kosh is like, dope. I like the attitude. Part of me was like, that's literally what you were doing. Like Kosh said he was going to get you ready to fight legends. Like he mm -hmm. was doing this already, but you're going to go, you're going to go. I, I don't know. You mentioned, uh, I don't know, a couple episodes ago, how, um, Sheridan has some definite Kirk qualities. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to go out. I'm going to be the one to do this. I'm going to, and, and th this, this is something Kirk would do. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, so we could wait, we could wait like maybe one or two years and gather up our forces and do stuff and actually fight them. Or I could just go to the planet now, possibly kill myself and maybe take the whole thing. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll just go. Give me a shuttle or I'll steal the enterprise. Like, let's do that. Mm. Felt very Kirk to me. I, I get it. You know, that's the picture of Sheridan they painted in this episode, but it still felt mm -hmm. to me just over the top for him. I don't know. He's just not a hothead to me. I, I didn't feel him as a hothead, and that's how he's acting. I, I, this actually one hundred percent rings true to me. Yeah, for what Sheridan is, as a as a guy who is the, um, the the commander of the army, he's the Star Killer. Like he's got this really cool vibe to him. Yeah, it, I mean, listen, between Sheridan and Sinclair, Sheridan is far cooler, man. Oh yeah, he's the guy. But he's got a he's got a beastie thread that you just don't see very often. Whereas Sinclair is just sort of this all the time on kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. Whereas Sher and and Sheridan Sheridan's the freaky one, man, because he he'll go ape crap on you when he loses it, you know. And especially when it's so personal to him, like it's his wife, yeah. you know. Yeah. So does she? I don't think she's going to show. Up. No, I think she's. Dead. I really think everybody else is dead. I think the whole group is dead now. If we see her. Maybe it's because she's also a space zombie, but I, I get the feeling Morden's the only one that that that's doing this thing. Yeah, and he did say, uh, and maybe he didn't die because he did say he must have been out doing a spacewalk or something. So if he was left alive because he wasn't there, and he cut a deal with them, like, hey, I'll do whatever you guys want me to do, just don't kill me. Maybe, maybe that's. Yeah, but I yeah I think the rest of the Icarus crew is dead. Yeah. Like it would be weird, I think, if they were actually still out there somewhere. The only person that could still be alive is Anna. Like every like no one else matters, and it would literally just be to like drive home, like just to mm -hmm. sit, push Sheridan over the edge. It'd, it'd be plot yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I got I got one more thing. Um, how much did you love the Jedi mind trick that Morden completely failed at pulling on Kaniki? Right. It's so great. It was, it was like so well. Is done. there something wrong with my card? And he's like, no, but just step over there. I am not the droid you're looking for. Uh, yes, <laughs> you are like, actually. Yeah, you come are. with it. <laughs> sit right there. <laughs> Let me blast your restraining bolt real quick. <laughs> and Kaniki was great too. He's just like, look, yeah. you know, hey, this is this is routine. Just step aside. Like it's cool. Right after he punches the thing on his deal, and you're like, oh shoot, <laughs> that's. It won't be a problem if you just step over there, sir. Right. Like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Well, Jeff, I, I think with that, we have reached the part of the show where we try to boil it down and see, does this have any of that Star Trek equality message to it? Does it hold a deep moral message? Is it holding up a mirror to society? Is it giving us hope 
for a better future. So I'm going to rate this on a scale of zero to five deltas. Jeff, you're going to rate this on a scale of zero to five star furies of how much we enjoyed this episode. I'm going to go first and mine's going to be real easy. I'm going to give this one no deltas. Really? There was nothing. I mean, you could talk about some things here and there. There was no message. This was information dump of what's happening here. You could stretch and pull some things out, but that's not what they were going for at all. So zero deltas to me. Fantastic episode. We've said sometimes lots of great Star Trek episodes would still get zero deltas themselves. This is one of those for me. What do you got? So I think this presented a very Star Trek message in it, in a, in a Babylon 5 way. And it was when um, it was the whole piece of you can go get Morden right now. You can tell them we know everything. You can get them. You can do it. Billions of people will die because they'll attack and they'll go. And then he told that story about Enigma and Churchill knowing they were going to bomb Coventry. But but in Star Trek, they talk about the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few or the one, except for when the few or the one actually outweigh the many. This was mm-hmm. strictly the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few, yeah. which is a zero delta message. Yeah, I completely agree. Because <laughs> because the because the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the one is fine when the one is making the choice. Right? When Spock makes the choice to sacrifice himself for the needs of the rest of the crew of the Enterprise, fine. Mm-hmm. When that choice is forced upon you, even through ignorance, that's not the Star Trek way. That's not the message that they get put in there. So I'm I'm going to stick by zero deltas. Totally. This yep. One. Yeah, what do you say, got on Star Series though? Because this so, was, this was a good episode. I, I will. Is, great episode. It was a great episode, and I I loved pretty much everything about it. Yeah. We got answers. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? When we get answers, that's a big deal. And I I mean we only touched on it a little bit, but Veer. Veer's hair grew, you know, two, three sizes, you know, to like right. in, in this episode. He's ready, you know. I mean, when he stood up to Sheridan, you know, it was just like yeah. that's on a need to know basis. That's confidential, mm-hmm. and he, you could see he was still a little nervous about it. But he's like, I'm going to do it. Veer is like, he's totally my hero right now. Right. But I got to be honest. On a second watch through, there were a couple cracks that started to show in this for me. Mm-hmm. Part of it was just, I mean, I t- we talked about the Sheridan thing. Mm-hmm. You made really good points, but I still hold on to it a little bit. Uh, but but really, it's that whole Babylon 5 storytelling piece of peace, 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 peace. Oh, we're just going to then literally tell you yeah. everything. Not show it, anything like that. We're just going to we're gonna tell it. But even with that, this has got to be one of the top three, like moving the galaxy forward episodes that we've seen mm-hmm. to this point. This is an awesome episode. I enjoyed it. I loved it. It is totally five star furies period. All right, Jeff. Well, with that, then um, our next piece comes in ranking these episodes, ranking the whole series season two. This is the 100% absolutely completely accurate, definitive ranking of Babylon five season two. And so I will ask you, good sir, where do you place in the shadow of Zaha doom? While you think about that, I will remind everybody what our current top five is. I got a feeling this one's going to be changing, but we'll see where Jeff places it because it's his pick and I don't get to change it. In first place, the number one episode of the season so far is The Coming of Shadows. Remember, we met the Centauri Emperor. That's where the war started, all that sort of stuff. A Race Through Dark Places. That was the one with Bester, I believe, when he came back and they fooled him at the very end with Talia. Uh, alone in the night, all alone in the night was it's the alien abduction one, the stribe, right? It was that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, hunter prey was one we just watched not too terribly long ago. And then soulmates, the brew ha 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 one, which made me laugh. I think this might be it for soulmates, but I don't know, Jeff, where do you place in the shadow of Zaha doom? This is, this is a lot harder than it should be because Brent, this should be the new number one. Like mm-hmm. it should be, but I really, really liked coming of shadows. Yeah. I really, really like the bester episode like a lot. Mm-hmm. Or was that a race through dark places? I get that the, sh- the shadows are like central to everything, but I, mm-hmm. I have been saying this 
throughout season two, I kind of don't care about the shadow stuff. I care a little bit more than mm-hmm. I did before. Okay. Let me offer an idea. Cause I have this idea. Cause this episode for me and maybe for you, we talked about it a little bit changed how I see some of the earlier episodes that we've already ranked. Mm-hmm. We're not far from our season two wrap up show. Like that's in just right. a couple more weeks. Would you be okay? What would you think if in that, you know, in the season one wrap up, we went through and did the full ranking and that took a really yep. long time and it was rough. We've been doing it here. What would you think if we revisited our ranking? Like, like looking back on the season, you talked about maybe doing a rewatch, but like what, my ranking is going to depend <laughs> right now. Like, would you be cool if in the wrap up show, we did kind of review our rankings and yeah, I, I because I think I'm going to have to do a, a binge rewatch of season two before we get to the end of this whole thing. I really do. Yeah. And I suspect that a lot of our rankings may change. And so I do think there's a, there's a, there, we should do a, a revisiting of the rankings and we'll open it back up to be able to shift it. But I think we need to place like some rules, like let's, let's invent the game. Yeah. Like, a, you know, like a white elephant, like you can choose to move it. But if you don't, then the other person can choose it. And if they don't, then nobody can change it later. Yeah, like that's where stuck. it is. Like, like you've got to, or like whatever the rule, you and I, will we'll get together. We'll talk about what those rules yeah. are. But we, it's, yes, I think we should do it. But I think we should turn it into one of our games. That yeah, we play I think it's a good idea. I like that. Okay, I'm going to so put Where are you going to place this one that is still 100% accurate and 100% definitive? Right. Right? Seriously, like you can't argue with it. This is objective. Right. I'm going to put this one then based on that right under a race through dark places. This is our new number three. Okay. I would have gone one lower, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's a tough uh, one. It, it, I, it feels, it feels bad to say like number four. Right. But, well, I uh, like this. Uh, and, and, I, and I, in my head, as you were going through, when we were talking, I had it between those. And I think I would rather watch this one than Hunter prey again and which is a tough right. call that's a tough it was a tough right. call but would you rather watch this one than alone in the dark than alone in the night yes yeah okay so Fair that was kind, of, kind of on all of, like with with both like yeah. going through both of those and that's that's a, yeah because yeah. i was stuck on the on the hunter prey at first for me it was all yeah it was it was there but um yeah i think that's uh all right that's good well brent that's it for in the shadow of zaha doom Next week, we're watching Knives for the first time. We don't look at recaps, summaries, thumbnails, anything. All we know is the name of the next episode. So, Brent, based on the title alone, Knives, what do you think it's going to be about? Well, Jeff, it was a good couple-week run here. Uh <laughs> I, you know, I said that I think we're going to turn and we're going to like just press, press the gas on moving forward with the story of Babylon five of of what's going on. That title says to me, nope, we're going to just have a weird random episode thrown in the middle of it. The only thing I can think about is this is going to be like a murder mystery. It's going to turn into, it's, it's going to be a fun episode. It's going to be a murder mystery. It's going to be a whodunit. We're going to get um, an inspector coming from off the station who's probably some cool, suave, you know, really good at his job kind of a dude. And he's going to interview everybody on the station. It turns out like everybody's going to be guilty of killing the guy. But turns out the guy is the one who actually killed himself. And this has just been a test. And he's actually still alive the whole time. Wow. That might have wow. been the plot of a movie that also <laughs> had the word knives in it as well. But that's my guess. I'm almost afraid this is like one of the casualties of the viewing order that we've picked, right? Kind of mm-hmm. like when we watched season one and it was like, we're going, we're going, we're going. And then the quality of mercy, which was a great episode, but it's like, this doesn't fit at the end of the season. Well, it, I, I think we watched, I said, we got to that spot. And I, I remember saying with the exception of a handful of episodes, we could have watched the entirety of season one in any order, mm-hmm. put them in a bag, shuffle them up. A couple of them have to fit in certain places. And other than that, have at it. Yeah. And Quality Mercy, we could have watched way early in the series. Or we could have watched it where we didn't. It wouldn't have changed it. Yeah. But I feel like this is going to be one of those. It's like, oh, this could have been somewhere else. But my guess is um, not too dissimilar to yours, but a little more focused. I think this is going to mm-hmm. be, we've really focused on the brutality of war 
so far, right? With Gropos and mm-hmm. uh, and the and now for a word, this is going to be about the subterfuge, the quiet killing that happens in war. I think mm-hmm. there's going to be an assassination attempt. Um, I think it's going to be by the Narn, one of the Narns on Londo, and Jakar is going to have to step in to smooth things over. Okay. Avoid an intergalactic incident over the assassination attempt. That's a way cooler idea. Maybe. Like way cooler (laughs) idea. Maybe. Okay. Well, we'll find out here next week. Thank you everybody for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, you can subscribe as well. And here's a little secret. We know that almost half of you watching this are not subscribed. So literally just take, there, you're subscribed. Just mm-hmm. do that really quick. Pop over to Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Pod Chaser. Leave us a review. I'm happy to read it here on the podcast. So until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Can I see your identity card, please? Uh, sure. Uh, is there a problem? Not if you step over there, there isn't. I, I don't think it's going to be necessary. Peace. Peace pe- and long life. It's my first time. There's a 100% chance, Brent, I'm going to need you to send me your audio. (laughs) I don't know how it was on your side, but we had a couple of hiccups. Okay. You actually mostly sound, your audio was mostly fine on my side of it. All Like the video froze a few times. Yeah. But for the most part, like, I thought you sounded just fine. So hopefully that goes out well on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully I'm okay on YouTube. Um, yeah, you you were great the whole time. Your audio went yeah. a couple times we, weird for me, but that, I think that was more a me thing. Okay. Um, yeah, so hopefully. And I'm, I'm glad we went ahead and did this and pushed through because it worked out. Yeah, it's like, you, you guys out at YouTube, listen, this is behind the scenes. This is how it works. This isn't the polished version. You guys know that. This is the fun version. This is the Jeff. I was in. <laughs> oh, take take whatever personal side of politics that any of you guys fall under. This is just funny, just funny. We recently had a president want to build a big wall between us and Mexico. Yeah, it happened here a couple, a yeah. little bit yeah, ago. Not, yeah, not too yeah. terribly long ago. I was in Mexico not too terribly long ago, oh. and down in Mexico they had all over the place. It was like, don't worry, you're on the fun side of the wall now. <laughs> It wow. was hilarious. Like, wow. Regardless of what you think of the wall, that was fun. <laughs> that was pretty good. It's good marketing is what that is. It was so good. It was so good. Was well, like, Club 65, good. welcome to the fun side of the wall. There you go. You welcome to the fun side of the wall. Yeah. That's the that's the second Club 65 t-shirt. That's it's it's Club 65. Like we'll put the the thing and it's just the fun side of the wall. Right. That's the tagline for Club 65. So um you guys that. But Jeff, yeah, I think we worked out. That's good. I'm I'm for any of you out there who ever want to own your podcast or run your own podcast one day or whatever content creation, sometimes the name of the game is get the content done. Right. Just do and it. And move on. You just got to get through it. If you spend too much time trying to perfect every little tidbit, you're going to you're gonna burn out and then you're not going to be producing content. There's a great saying, and that is don't let uh, good enough get in the – or don't let perfect get in the way of good enough. And that's, yeah. uh, I think, too many yeah. – great creations die because we never see them because people are trying to get it perfect. Mm -hmm. And I listen, I am a fan of excellence and high quality, but that has to be measured at some point. At some point you just got to get it out. Deadlines hit and you just got to move and you take what you can get and make it as best you possibly can. So anyway, that's all I got. Uh, You guys are awesome. Jeff, I think I have to amend my thing. I think you might be right about the people on the Icarus. I think so. I think, I think that that it just rings true. Yeah. I guess that, that is such see, a thing. Does that mean we're going to see Anna again? I think so. Is she, so she's she's like mordening oh, just out man. somewhere else. Yeah. Is like she saying else. what do you want somewhere else? Like in some like some League of Non-Aligned Worlds or yeah, something. Yeah, she's like off that? with the Drazi somewhere or something doing that. And here's the thing. Oh man, it's gonna be so gross. She's gonna end up face to face with Sheridan, and sh- Sheridan's gonna have to take her down. Right. Yeah. He's gonna have to kill his own wife. Yeah. That's a hundred percent where this is going. Oh, oh my gosh. 
Oh, oh, are the are the are so are the shadows like the Borg of oh, Babylon wow. Five? Like they right. assimilate as they go. Right. Oh, wow. You know, turn turn people into the into their little machines, right? And and move on. You know, Club Sixty Five. You guys are gonna be the only ones that hear Brent talking about this because. <laughs> You can't this admit is, that you're changing your mind until until proven wrong. Like, right now, yeah. now, yeah, now I've got to stand by what I said. But I think, I just the, when the more you said it, I was like, nah, nah, nah. But the more like, yeah, that that sounds right. That sounds right. Okay, we're gonna get out of here, guys. Say hey, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Um, you guys are here. That means you're subscribed. So I'm not gonna ask you to subscribe. But if you happen to be visiting us here at Club Sixty Five, um, subscribe. Become a part of Club 65. Totally. What is Club 65, you may ask? It's the group that stays till the end. Because most people like hear us winding up and then they jump out. So you guys get the special bonus stuff just for sticking around. It's pretty cool. Jeff, say let's buy to. Let's, wow, I'm going to try that again. <laughs> Jeff, let's say goodbye to Club 65 for the evening. Goodbye, Clubs, Club 65. Have a great, have a great one. Peace out, guys.